The chairman of the Independent National Electoral Commission, Ainek Mahmoud Yakubu, has announced that sensitive electoral materials will in the meantime no longer be routed through the Central Bank of Nigeria. He also specifically notes that beginning from the Ekiti state governorship election, INEC will not keep its sensitive materials with the CBN. According to him, the decision is to guarantee that electoral materials for the lined up elections are not compromised. Several individuals and groups have raised serious concern about the sanctity of election materials kept with the CBN after the report that the CBN governor, Godwin Emifili, was indicating interest to contest for the country's presidential seat. Uh, and when that story hit the air airwaves, it cost a lot of opera. Well, joining us to discuss this is Paul James. He's the program's manager of elections for Yaga Africa. And also joining us is Ebenezer Wickener. He's the founder of Policy Shapers. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for joining us. There'd be no better set of people to have this conversation with. Thank you and good evening. Great. Now, Paul James, um, it's very interesting that this is a conversation um, that first and foremost, the basis for which this conversation even became a conversation is that the man who sits at the Apex Bank um, did not only just say he was going to run for an office, he went to court. And um, for this, it, it violates so many rules and laws as, you know, as it um, has to do with um, the civil service or public service and, of course, the Electoral Act. Um, but as we speak, he is still the central bank governor. Hence, INEC is saying we cannot route our sensitive materials through the CBN. Should that be the first thing that we should be thinking of in a case like this? Or should we be pushing for the law to take its course as, it, as regards the CBN governor? I think for me, first and first, is also about how to protect the sanctity of the institution of INEC. Uh, because that's the commission that we know have suffered a lot of trust. Uh, it has a lot of tag, trust deficit tag on it, and so it has also been trying uh, all these years to see how it can redeem itself of that kind of notion from the vast majority of Nigerians. It is unfortunate that this is also happening to the body polity as at this point in time, especially also regarding the CBN governor. Now, we must also get it that as a Nigerian, he has the right to uh, he has the right to want to uh, aspire for the highest position of the land. But of course, also he also need to understand that um, the position he holds and the institution he represents are also I mean, and also his own aspiration as a Nigerian are completely opposite, completely are different. Uh, they are completely opposite. So as such. I anticipated that if you were a person of integrity, a person of high moral standard, given also the kind of questions or doubts that this would raise, that we shouldn't have had this opera, that when he knew he had the ambition to contest, he would have just stepped aside. But I think also on the part of Anne, Anne did what I thought was right at this point in time. But then also the big question to ask is, must we also continue to go uh, through this route? We need to begin to think about building confidence in our institutions and also learning from what we have seen in other democracies. We have places where we even hear about sensitive or non-sensitive materials. People pick up election materials on election day. They move from their houses to polling unit to go cast their votes. And so we also not also lose part of our side. We shouldn't also forget the fact that elections are getting better. With the new electoral laws that we have now, voting will not going to be based on people that are even accredited. So if we have all of this, uh, this sort of things in our, or if we have this sort of strong uh, legislation in our electoral laws, uh, my sense is I don't think we need to even be spending so much of money, one, going outside of the country to produce a sensitive materials, Two, the logistics also involve our first depositing them with the CBI before we start moving them to the state or the location where they will be used, as the case may be. So, I mean, I know this is what I thought is right, moving them straight to his office in Ado, and then from there onward distribution to the local government. But I also think that is something they should explore going forward. But then if that... Uh, 
if that question of integrity continue to hang in the air, especially about the CBN, then my own advice to them is to begin to explore other agencies of government that we think we can trust. Maybe the military, if they have facility that can hold our sensitive materials, uh, 2023 is not far from now, so I need to, need to begin to explore how to go about this problem so they can, it can inspire confidence in voters. These okay. measures that the INF chair has taken last week, Saturday, I'm sure, will, uh, will, 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 will help to improve the standing of the commission, especially in terms of voters' uh, confidence in the ability of INF to ensure a free and credible process in Ekiti State. Let me move to Ebenezer. Ebenezer, you obviously lead a group of people who are called policy shapers. And I want to ask the same question, but in a different way. How did we even get to a point where we are at a, a place where we're looking for where to safeguard our elect sensitive electoral materials that originally would be safest in the Central Bank of Nigeria? Because I'm thinking now, the question I asked when... Uh, Professor Mahmoud Yakub made that statement was, so where else are we going to, um, you know, safeguard these materials, being that the elections for Ekiti and Oshun State are just around the corner? How did we even get here to even begin with? Well, I mean, I've, I've heard so many versions of, uh, you know, what the law says and what the law doesn't say, you know, with regards to if the central bank government has the authority or has the right you know, to, to contest the public office while still being the central bank government. You know, I think I think if you look at it from a moral perspective, I don't I don't blame anyone that feels unsafe with the central bank government, you know, running or, or I mean making making his intention known, you know, to, to, to run for public office. And you know, I think that just as you know, Paul, Paul Stock said, you know, we, when we hear the American elections, we don't, we don't hear too much conversations around sensitive, <laughs> sensitive electoral materials. In fact, elections start way, way, way before the election goes you know, to the elections of people who are overseeing. The election is, is, very, is very coordinated in such a way that all of those glitches that we, that we see in our country, we don't, we don't get to see them. But again, this is what happens when we look for strong men, not strong institutions. Um, I mean, if, if our institutions are strong enough, and if it happens that we don't have a law currently that, that, that stops someone within that position from running to the reserve, I think there's no for that kind of law. You know, if, if anybody wants to, wants to um, contest or for office, just like you know, the ministers do, you, you, you step down, you resign, you move, you move on, you become an ordinary citizen, and then you begin, you begin to contest for, for, for that election. I, I also think that there are two things I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of, and I think Equity like, State is a good um, case, case study. It should be a good chance to test this, this new um, thoughts by INEC. But two things I'm thinking of first is logistics. We know that Nigeria has a challenge of you know, election material, not getting to the position, not getting to the um, electoral units on, on time. time units, they have to go then to 4 o'clock, 3 o'clock, to, to get their. Yeah, yeah, they're, they're so it's that has that been a challenge because of the central bank, or with this new move of moving the sensitive materials to the INEC office in the state and eventually to the polling unit be a better solution? That is still left for us to, to see. Um, I'm also thinking of security, and I think Paul, Paul is right for us to need to begin to think of ways to involve even the military. I mean, there's nothing wrong just because we know where we are currently. And knowing that you know there is very little trust in the electoral system, anything we can do to make people feel like they're old town, I think we should we should definitely do. And you know, security, making sure that logistics are on point, ensuring that things move very fast from the respective energy offices to, to the polling units would be a very important um, step step to take. All right, we see that you know what we are all applauding you know the fact that the electoral act um, as amended has given our election or uh, the electoral process a boost of sorts and Nigerians have some, some level of hope. Um, but then again, I'm looking at responsibilities being packed on INEC, responsibilities that should originally not be their problem, being heaped on INEC, being that there's been a lot of dereliction of duties or a lot of lawlessness in terms of how the, our electoral processes should run. Um, and what does that do to the back of INEC, being that they already have their plate full? 
Um, I mean, we have governments and leaders and legislators who choose, pick and choose what laws, um, you know, to obey. And then, of course, at the end of the day, INEC has to um, somewhat shoulder some of these responsibilities that, it, that are not necessarily uh, INEX in the first instance. How do we even, um, you know, unburden INEC? going forward. It's not enough for us to say, well, oh, we're going to be electronically transmitting results. But what about the other loopholes that need to be plugged? Well, I, I think if that question is to me, um, there have been a lot of advocacy around on bundling INEC, and I think uh, it's gradually yielding fruits because there are conversations also around, for instance, starting um, an electoral offenses commission that will take up that responsibility of prosecution away from INEC. And also the part that remains to be seen is the part about handling election logistics. Don't forget INEC is also managing political party, uh, monitoring political party primaries and the likes. So me, I think it would be a greater achievement if we're able to unbundle INEC and especially take off the part around management of election logistics. If we recall what happened in 2019, the eve of the election, uh, before the election was postponed, we heard that some senior, uh, some high-ranking INEC officials were even at the, uh, were seen around the, uh, the uh, air, air force, for instance, trying to shift uh, election materials on the eve of the election to some states are across the country. And so that also, I mean, divides their attention. Instead of uh, planning or preparing for the election that was to happen the day ahead, INEC officials were busy going around. So I think it will be a big, a big uh, uh, achievement, like I said, if that is, if we're able to achieve that. Within the premise of what we have currently, for instance, we are seeing improvement, especially around the election. That's why me, I hold the opinion that the idea of sensitive or not sensitive material, we should begin to think about how that will go off our election. For instance, if you think about the bimodal voter preparation system that has not been introduced, yeah. it has a dual capacity of checking your fingerprints, checking the facial recognition and also the permanent voter's card. This is also telling us that without the PVC, for instance, we should be able to vote. That is, if I'm able, if the correct voter has approached an ex official and then the person is, uh, uh, the fingerprint is, uh, is authentic, verified, it should be able to bring up the voter's detail on the bimodal voter accreditation uh, device, especially where it is properly coded or entered on the device. So okay. if we have that, I think we should begin to get to the conversation of saying, taking off even the idea of voter's card, uh, a permanent voter's card from the elections, or we're taking about uh, what we can use to identify voter, okay. maybe any means of identification before the voter votes. Okay. But also, within the existing framework also, I have talked earlier about uh, how, uh, I mean, uh, think about what determines over voting now it's going to be based on the number accredited mm -hmm. by that it means an individual how to come to the polling unit before the person is administered for the election so it means okay. that will eliminate the idea of uh, even i mean anybody can take the sensitive materials in the polling or election it has to be the, the correct voter before the person is allowed to vote okay all right quickly because we are out of time but these are um just in a few words um, as young persons who are pushing um, for good governance, uh, young persons who are saying enough is enough, we want the right things to be done, um, should we also not be pushing for, I don't know, some form of um, the strengthening of you know, the rule of law or the judiciary in terms of airing uh, persons, um, you know, people who are going against you know, the Electoral Act or the laws of the land in terms of running for offices or, um, you know, um, remember that there was a drag within the House of National Assembly as to um, who should step down 30 days before the elections, you know, for public office holders. It's, it's not enough for us to say, let's all get our PVCs, but what about us pushing for proper good governance and also helping the judiciary to do its job? Quickly. Yeah, apologies, I just had a process. Um, but if, if I could just um, quickly jump in, I think I think it's a, it's a I think it's a work in progress, right? Just as just as Paul, Paul said, I don't think we'll be able to get every form of reform at the same time. I mean, the Electoral Act was a huge victory, and it's a it's a first step in the right direction. Uh -huh. And I think as we continue to work together, as we continue to advocate for the correct you know, things to be done, 
as you continue to advocate for the rule of law to be to be followed. I mean, I'm, I'm just excited saying that political parties. I mean, for the first time, really, just me observing that they were, they were scared to not beat the INEC deadline. Really, that that's been going cool, right? So it means that people really can respect law. And so if we continue to emphasize and we continue to ask for the right things to be done, I'm sure we eventually get there. Right? But I think it's the first time they didn't get their PVCs. Because it's only when they get their PVCs that they can vote, right? And then as we continue the process, we can continue to advocate for other, other key issues. Well. well, I want to say thank you, gentlemen. Paul James is of Yaga, and Ebenezer Wickener is the founder of Policy Shapers. Uh, thank you so much for being part of the conversation and keep doing uh, the good work. Thank you very much, and good luck to you too. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you all for staying with us. Um, well, we have our eyes on the Eagle Square where the ruling All Progressive Congress is uh, um, about to have its uh, convention and, of course, the presidential primaries. And every single person uh, in this country is waiting to find out who emerges as the flag bearer. We'll bring you more reports in our subsequent news bulletins. I'm Mary Anna Cohn. Thank you for watching. Have a good evening.